really is good to see everyone again this evening. Many of you know me good enough by now to know that I am not a carpenter, and neither am I the son of a carpenter. But I have learned some pretty good advice from an old carpenter, and that is always measure twice and cut once. And I think that's pretty good advice because many a novice carpenter has quickly and thoughtlessly made a cut because they were, that was wrong because they were in a hurry or they were just careless. And when you make mistakes like that, especially in uh, times like today when lumber is so expensive, <clears throat> it can be very costly. It can cost you with the replacement of another board because all it takes is just a half inch and you can ruin a whole piece of lumber. It will also cost you a trip back to the hardware store. And it's gonna cost you time that you could have spent in doing your project. So the lesson is, the more consequential a, an action is, the more carefully that it needs to be thought out. Wise people know that it's never a waste of time to ensure accuracy. It's far better to make sure that you are right, deliberately, cautiously, and carefully than to hastily and to thoughtlessly act in ways that turn out to be wrong. Not being careful can cause you a lot of extra work. It can also cause a lot of harm, pain, suffering, trouble, even money. And thus it is important to realize that a person's life can also be ill-measured. To recognize this fact, all you have to do is go home, turn on your television, and watch the news. And you see so many people carelessly giving themselves over to recreational drugs, alcohol, crime. Also, many people have wasted their lives, destroyed their families' lives because of becoming obsessive gamblers. And this carelessness also has destroyed countless marriages. Perhaps we might have friends or family members that have not really measured their lives like they ought to. In fact, we might even go home and find a person like that staring us in the mirror. But here's the worst scenario of all, that many are sometimes shockingly careless in regard to God and to his will. And the cost of this mistake is extremely expensive because it will cost us our soul. Jesus asked a question in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We need to heed the advice and the example of the master carpenter when it comes to our actions in religion. So this evening we're going to consider some areas of religion in which we need to make sure that we measure twice before we cut. And one of those areas that we need to measure twice is in the area of re religion in general. The casual and haphazard way in which many people have tossed about religion today is mind-boggling to me. The average person who has rejected religion has done so on the basis of hastily made assumptions from inadequate inf inf information and not from a serious study and consideration of God's holy word. Many have never taken the time to try to investigate the stereotypes, the caricatures, the prejudicial slogans that many people have used to turn people away from religion. I come from a time when I remember when the Beatles were very, very popular. And John Lennon was one of those people of that group. And he made a statement one time and said that religion is simply an opium for the people. I don't know how many of you all remember Jesse Ventura. He was a wrestling champion, if you call it wrestling. I call it acting, mostly. Not that I would tell that to his face, but he became the governor of Minnesota. And he made the statement that religion shows the stupidity of the people. There's many television worship services 
and many denominations that have turned religion into nothing but a circus sideshow. And it's because of influences like these and many others that many shake their head in disgust at religion as they witness such foolishness and they turn people away from God. Sadly, people today, they don't have the curiosity that the Athenian philosophers did when they had the chance to hear the case of Christianity. I want you to take your Bibles, if you have them, and let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Paul is on his second missionary journey, and he comes to the country of Greece, and he enters into the capital of that country, the city of Athens. I want you to listen to the inspired story of Paul as he enters into that city, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, he's waiting for Timothy and Silas, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore he disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And though their curiosity might not have been for the right reason, it did allow them to hear the truth of God's word. And believe me, Paul was willing to tell them the truth. Now, I want you to listen to his masterful sermon beginning in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. Some versions say they were too religious. He says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things that are therein seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art or man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, of course, with the hearing of this sermon, as with the hearing of most sermons, the results are both positive and negative. Look at verses 32 through 34. It says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among which was uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. You know, if just people were interested enough to listen and to hear, some would believe. But the sad thing is there are more people today like those who hurriedly mocked than those who wanted to hear and make up their minds. People today just don't ever measure thoroughly before they cut. When we consider religion, 
we should never measure how we feel about the issue, but we need to consider the evidence of the truth. In fact, this is exactly what the attitude of the psalmist was. Listen to the words of the sweet psalmist David in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 5. He says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Why not be like the sweet psalmist David? A man after God's own heart who considered the evidence and measured thoroughly before he cut. Choosing religion or not is a matter that does need to be measured twice. That is, careful consideration needs to be given to it. Now here's another place that we need to measure twice before we cut, and that's in choosing a church. Have you ever considered how thoughtless the average person's analysis is of what is going on in what we call Christian denominationalism? Many say, well, one church is good as another. Many others say, attend the church of your choice. And so it's no wonder that many people's approach to choosing a church is no better than just a hit or miss. Or maybe sticking your hand in a bag and grabbing whatever comes out. If all seven of the churches that we read of in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 were in our community, on what basis would we decide where we would identify ourselves? How carefully would we check the accuracy of the churches and their practices against the authoritative word of God? The question of whether a doctrine is true or not is certainly not a trivial matter, and it's going to take some searching out to find out. Warning after warning has been given to us that we need to be careful, not just what we hear, but also what we do. Solomon gave a caution to us in Proverbs 14, verse 12. He says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And thus Paul gives us a, an admonition in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Now this is an individual responsibility that each and every one of us has to do. We have to examine ourselves. We need to measure ourselves carefully. Thus Paul urged the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And the Apostle Peter even trumped these words with 1 Peter 4, verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And don't forget the words of the Apostle of Love. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Friends and brethren, are you not listening what the scriptures are telling us? That we need to be careful, we need to measure carefully. Dealing responsibly with the problem of modern religious division does require at least the attitude that the Bereans had in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. It says that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. There's only one church. Christ only promised to build one all other churches that you see in the world are nothing but counterfeit churches. But there's another place that we need to measure twice. That's in the area of Christian living. In a world that is so filled with evil, there is no realistic hope of living eternally with God if we don't have a careful approach to the matter of godly living. 
As was read in our scripture reading this evening in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 17, Paul says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, that ye walk upright, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Careful consideration. Now I want you to imagine your life as a speech. What kind of speech have you prepared? Is the text of your speech painstakingly prepared? Have you given it thought? Have you done research? Is it packed with a little bit of common sense? Or is it just an impromptu performance that you just make up as you go along? And which do you think is going to have the best results? Well, I think you know it's going to be that prepared speech. Our lives are a lot like building a brick wall. And you always build it one brick at a time. And this is exactly what the Lord requires of us as we build our lives as his children. Now in Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, Amos saw the Lord standing upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to Amos, Amos, what seest thou? And he said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not again pass by them anymore. Once that first brick is laid out of line, then the rest of the bricks that follow will also be out of line. And when the project is finished, you're going to have a wall that is completely out of plumb. Thus the Lord will not overlook those who are religiously astray, because he knows that if it's allowed to continue on, then there will be others who will follow that person out of line. We need more men and women who continuously and carefully distinguish right from wrong. Or as Paul said, who have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Socrates was reported to have once said, the unexamined life is not worth living. In other words, life is too consequential not to be thoughtful, not to be deliberate about its examination. We ought to carefully settle on our convictions and then fit our lives to those convictions. But too often, we just do that which merely comes naturally to us, and then we build a set of convictions to go around that. But remember the warning that the prophet gave in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. The spiritual consequences of ill-measured deeds are eternal. And we cannot afford to be able to cut now and measure later. We get one life and one life only. And once it's done, it cannot be undone. So what kind of words would describe the quality of your life's workmanship up till now? Would you describe it as haphazard, slipshod, makeshift, careless? Or would you describe it as purposeful, meticulous, careful, calculated, thorough. The only way that our workmanship can ever be approved by God is to have a thorough study of his word, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, and then living according to those precepts. Yes, it is vital that we study to find the truth. That truth is found in God's holy word, John 17 verse 17. We need to think about the significance and the implications of that truth and then we need to act on the basis of that truth and live our lives accordingly. Jesus told us that we are to count the cost of discipleship in Luke chapter 14 verses 25 through 33 and this would involve an equally sober assessment of the cost of non-discipleship. 
The fact is, it's going to cost us a whole lot more to refuse that discipleship than it does to accept that discipleship. So how carefully have you considered this? How many times have you measured yourself? So far, has your response to Jesus been the result of careful consideration and deliberate actions? Because he deserves nothing less. Remember, it is he who giveth to all life and breath and all things. And it's in him that we live and move and have our very being. Have you actually measured twice with regard to your salvation? Now, God's way of salvation is very easy to understand. And yet it's sad that so many people have disregarded what Jesus has said. Jesus tells us clearly in his holy word what we must do in order to obtain salvation, in order to obtain eternal life. He says that we must believe that he is who he claimed to be, that he is the very Son of God. He is God in the flesh, the promised Messiah, the one who can give eternal life. He says, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins, John 8, verse 24. Now, the sad thing is many people have not measured properly, and they stop right there. They make their cut. But Jesus didn't stop there. He not only said that we have to believe in him, he also tells us in Luke 13, verse 3, that we must repent or we will perish. Repentance is a change of mind that brings about a change of action and lifestyle. And then he also said that we must confess him before men in order to be confessed before the Father in heaven. And he said if we deny him before men, he will also deny us before the Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. But Jesus still doesn't stop right there. He tells us in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism is essential. It doesn't matter what the religious world says because they have cut way too early. They didn't measure properly. Jesus said we must be baptized. Peter said the same thing, that baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Have you done this? Have you measured properly to become a child of God? And if not, you have the opportunity to change that this evening. But again, Jesus still doesn't stop even there. We must remain faithful in order to receive the crown of life, Revelation 2, verse 10. And if you have not measured your life properly, you're not living your life as it should, according to God, according to his measure, you have the opportunity to change things. What about you? Are you willing to make that change? If there's anything that we can help you with to help your, your journey to heaven, let us help you. Once you come while together, we stand and sing.